I'm really excited uh, to hear from Priyanka. You know, once again, you know, we've had her as, as a speaker before. Um, uh, Priyanka is a senior manager of quality engineering at GoodRx. Uh, he comes in with you know 12 years of experience um, in the industry. He's very passionate about uh, you know QA. Um, you know, speaks at multiple conferences. You know, just specializes in hiring, training, uh, and mentoring new QA members. You know, she's built up uh, the QA. Um, the QA team, you know, from the ground up at GoodRx. Um, I'm sure she'll be sharing some of that. Uh, in her spare time, Priyanka loves, you know, spending time with her daughter, you know, trying out new food and traveling. Um, uh, today, Priyanka will be pulling, you know, from her tried and tested playbook, you know, that she and her team have built up um, and be sharing some of some, some automation approaches, um, sort of what helps them lead the high scale operation that they have going on. Um, you know, where you're maintaining a high level of quality while, you know, keeping the rocket ship uh, going at high speed, um, at full speed, in the right direction, of course. Um, I'll let Priyanka take it from here. Uh, Priyanka, over to you. Thanks, Jay. Hello, everyone. As Jay mentioned, this is Priyanka, and, and I'm going to talk about uh, modern op um, automation approaches. Um, what it is about, um, so we hear a lot of things, how people are doing automation, but how they make it super solid, we hardly hear about that. So I'm trying to attempt to tell you all the nooks and hooks, what actually goodrx.com does, what my amazing team does to make it um, super solid. Um, so the agenda for next uh, 45 minutes, a little bit more intro about me. Um, then we will start with the industry standard, like what your automation should look like, what should be some of the key points that you should look for when you create your automation, like writing scripts is not enough uh, if you want to work in an enterprise level um, application with a lot of load. And then we go uh, dig dive into what are some of the approaches GoodRx taking to make it super solid. And at the end question and answer. Um, so to start, I have almost 14 years of experience, started my career with uh, Accenture back in 2006, which was the same my level five, um, worked with Dell R&D India for two years, then came to United States, and now I call myself a startup specialist. Um, in 2019, I started my speaking career. My first talk was with Browser Stack in San Francisco. And uh, after that, I just didn't have to look back because I kept on getting invitation to speak about what GoodRx does, how my team does automation, what we are doing. Um, so I mainly talk a lot about quality engineering, what some of the um, cool stuff happening in our industries, a lot about automation. Um, I am a great fan of AI ML tool, so you will find some of my talks on that. And then um, there is one more talk I'm doing on Monday for Test Leadership Congress on uh, some leadership learning. So do come join that as well. And uh, last but not the least, I'm on a mission to prove that there is no bug-free software in production. So if you want to uh, follow me on Twitter, you will find me posting a lot of bugs from various uh, big applications uh, and some interesting one, how it uh, makes it to production, though they have very big uh, quality engineering teams or good practices. Um, so I usually start with a cartoon. I have a three years old daughter, uh, four years old daughter, as Jess said. So uh, this is in a nutshell what I do, quality engineering practices. So I join a company where they're playing a game of mole, where every time a bag, bug happens, they just try to fix it. Hire more QA engineer, try to fix it, fix more bugs. But uh, our mission as a team in GoodRx is to make it like a game of operation on the right side. So it's like every time a developer touches something wrong, our system should tell them that mm -mm, this is not you're supposed to do. Some test is broken, go fix it and uh, then ship to production. So on a lighter note, let's talk about some uh, industry standard. Like when you start um, writing your codes, what it, um, what you should look for. So there are four categories you should be looking for. The first one is platform coverage. So you should cover at least top five platform. And how will you know what is your uh, top five platform? Uh, go to your Google Analytics or whatever analytics tool you have, um, and then uh, make sure that wherever you're 
customers are. Check it monthly, quarterly, and make sure your coverage, test coverage is giving you the coverage your user needs, right? And it's, it's astonishing that uh, only 70, 62.5% uh, companies in the industry has uh, five or more coverages. Um, then the next one is quality of your test. So when you have an automation infra in, uh, in place, you have to make sure that 90% uh, of the test passes every time, right? And if it is in CI, we actually uh, look for more than 90% uh, most of the time. And only 18.8% .8 in the industry can reach this kind of um, rates. Um, again, runtime, like when you are doing your automation framework, make sure that you are right, not writing too big of a test or you are not checking too many points in one test. So your goal will be to make the test less than uh, two minutes, right? And uh, only seven, only 39, 35.9% companies um, actually able to hit this uh, mark. And concurrency, we know that uh, cloud provider like browser stack, they give us a lot of parallels. Uh, we have to buy them. Um, so suppose you have 20 parallels, you have to make sure your peak utilization is at least 75%. And I'm going to show you some of our um, usages in GoodRx, like how we are utilizing the infra. And uh, industry is doing pretty good. So 70.9% uh, companies today utilizing the parallels pretty well. So given that, so if we have to do this kind of like set this kind of very aggressive goal to ourselves, what all do we need to do to make our infra work really well, right? So my rest of the presentation is going to be um, that, but given that I wanna show you some data. So let's start with data and then we move on to the strategies and, and some cool tricks that we do, right? So this is first year with Browser Stack. Um, we actually working more than two years now with them. Uh, first year, we ran 2.7 million tests whole year, uh, 367 days, right? And uh, this is again three months, uh, beginning of the year. So we ran almost 310,000 automated tests. We have CI pipelines. Um, our, no, like goodrx.com, none of the features goes live without running our tests, right? We run almost 690 tests each time somebody um, pushes something to a pipeline and something to look for is the error rate. And like, I'm a big fan of my team because something amazing they have achieved. It's 0.14% error rate we have. The pass rate is 94.87% um, and fail is 1.18%. And in that failure, most of them are actually bugs. It's not like flake, uh, flaky test or something. We do have flaky tests sometimes, but amazing stability that we provide uh, using our framework. And on the right side, you are seeing our parallel usages. Most of the days, like we were hitting 100 parallel nodes. Um, so recently we have switched to 165 uh, because um, we have, like our team has grown tremendously this year. We have hired more than 80 people from January. And um, so like we needed better infra um, to scale. So this is showing like in a daily basis, how much test is written. So we have five to 15 uh, releases happening every day. So we almost run on a peak day, we have ran 16,000 um, tests from Feb like between February uh, to April, right? Um, and the last one is again, this year session. So you see only six months, we have ran 3.1 uh, million tests. And right now we are utilizing 160 parallels. So we had 100 till May. In 2018, we actually started with 25 and we are um, slowly scaling it there. And if you see our latest parallel usages, um, we are, um, again, almost hitting some of the day 160 parallels, but doing pretty good. We are uh, in 75% of the usage most of the time. So now let's talk about um, our framework. So this was our core framework that we started with in uh, GoodRx. We call it our next gen SWOT framework, um, software automation test, SWOT stands for. Um, so this is like a bird view 
of our automation framework. So we have um, step definition, BDD, page objects, wrappers, visual validations. Um, we use browser stack, our infra, our orchestration is through Jenkins and Travis. Uh, we also use Blaze Meter for um, synthetic monitoring. Selenium is our core SDK. We use Apple tools for visual validations. Um, so this is how the whole infrastructure, and we have uh, awesome cool reporting that I'm gonna show you next. So why don't we take a step back and just talk about why do we need automation framework, right? So automation framework is amalgamation of uh, guidelines and coding standards. So we do need automation framework because suppose today you're starting for a very small startup and you just like to do like some dirty scripting. Tomorrow when the startup grows and uh, you have more teams, more product to support, you will be again starting from the beginning if you don't have an automation framework in place which is scalable right so when you google you see these points that shows up like you need to have assertions on actions you should do before test and after test where you do initialization and clean up after each test you should be using mocking as much as possible right so uh, if we talk about tdd which our developer starts with um then they start mocking the APIs when APIs is not ready and make sure that there is a failing test, right? Keep your configuration separate, um, use abstraction as much as possible, use wrappers. If you use a lot of third party tools, our SDKs, um, we do a lot. Like we have uh, mailing infrastructure with MailSore, we have um, SMS infrastructure with Trulio. So we use almost every cases we use wrappers so that if anything goes down um, on those SDKs, like our infrastructure is not affected. Um, then again, local and cloud setup. If you guys do mobile automation, it's very hectic to do the mobile automation look like using cloud setup. So have a local setup for that. Even if you are shifting left, it's very, very important that your um, test runs on lower environments, not only in production, um, some debugging features. So log as much as possible so that if a developer is uh, looking for like failures and trying to fix they have enough information and it's not cryptic cross browser absolute needed like if i give example of GoodRx, our customers are on 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 ie safari um chrome mostly so and again on mobile web so biggest customers are on mobile web um, safari and android chrome android um, native uh, web so we have to have at least six browser coverages which we do uh, like seamlessly with browser stack, right? And then simulator, emulator versus real devices. I am very fond of real devices because in my whole career, I could not find the bugs I was finding in real devices through simulator emulators. One of the, again, main reason we use browser stack because uh, it's very seamlessly, we can run our test on a real device. Our mobile web also runs on real device using browser stack. And then built in reporting. So if you can make it super clear, the reports, um, then it becomes very easy for the whole team um, to collaborate and see how our tests are performing. So let's get started. What I'm gonna talk about today, so I promise that I'm gonna talk about uh, AB testing feature flagging, uh, local connection versus uh, CDN, cloud delivery network, uh, some cool tricks about how to make your mobile app automation solid, uh, which is capability generator, accessibility, ID parity, uh, debug capabilities. And then in the end, we're gonna touch a little bit about the AI tools we are using to make our test super solid. So let's talk about AB testing. What is AB testing? So this is my favorite question when I interview people in my team. And I guess 95% of the time people have no clue um, what is A-B testing, um, but when you are working for a company like GoodRx or even any startup because they are trying to prove themselves in the industry, right? And they have to rapidly change and understand what users want. So they do A-B testing. So A-B testing means think about the main side as your control, like in the left side. Um, and then suppose you are releasing a new feature, you will release it as a variation. So, and only some percentage of your user will hit that variation, right? So uh, on a live system, you will have 
two version of your application a and b and uh, you will measure like if b is performing better than a so you, in your mind you don't want to affect your core users right at the same time you want to see if b is performing better than your core user right then you take the decision after maybe 7 to 14 days how your new variations are working you choose a winner and then you productionize that but in between that 7 to 14 days both your applications will be um, in your productions right so both, uh, some of the users will be hitting a some of the users will be hitting b now come this challenge in automation like how will will you make sure that uh, this kind of system um, has no bugs right and your automation is able to understand like which flow is it going through um, so that i'm gonna discuss in my second slide let me touch base a little bit about what is feature flagging so feature flagging is again similar to a b test but here suppose you're working on a very big feature and you can actually put that feature in production but it will be behind a feature flag which is not on so behind the AB test where I'm saying B version will be 0%. So no user will go through that flow, but it's on production. Again, as a QA team, we have to make sure first the feature flag works, right? When they're saying off, it's not showing up on production. And second, we have to thoroughly test it with our automation and QA team and then push it to production. So what are the challenges when it comes to A-B testing, right? Like again, as I told you, uh, dynamic routing, uh, because um, like how will you know, like how will you get a deterministic path to that which flow it will go, right? And uh, it can pollute your code if you have too many if and else statement and you can introduce bug, you can forget to remove that code if you're writing in your um, own, like the uh, main core framework. It can slow your test down and make it very, very fragile, right? Um, we also have to make sure it's uh, fault tolerant because when suddenly they take down the test or suddenly they turn the feature flag on, we have to make sure our tests are in place to, for the core functionalities. So how do we do that? Uh, these are some of the very cool techniques that we do. And in the left side, you're seeing our, one of our actual tests. Um, so what we do is we actually create a separate folder, A-B test folder, where all our A-B tests are resides together. So that way we have a clear view. What are the A-B pages uh, currently we have test on? So once, if they turned off the test, we periodically check and remove them from that folder, right? Easy to remove. The second one, we use tags heavily. So when you look at the, on the top, it says at the rate AB desktop, home subtitles equal to home page sub, subtitle variant. So using that tag, we are saying, this is the variant we're gonna test. So please uh, pass this as cookie and uh, get us land on that page, uh, goodaris.com homepage, with, which has this subtitle variant, right? So use of cookie, we are testing um, everything. One more thing to uh, make uh, very clear here that you have A-B test. Um, let, let me actually show you our website with um, example, one second. So here, so if you look at goodarix.com, suppose this is the new feature they're launching, right? See an online doctor. So only some of you will be able to see this. But in this variant, you have to make sure that our search is working, our save big on is working, and our recently view uh, things are working too. So when you are setting the cookies, you have to make sure you are selecting the right test and you are not forgetting about your core functionalities as you are testing the new uh, feature too. So that's how we do it here. So we run all our P1 tests um, using the new variant. At the same time, we add the newer test as well. Let's talk about the next one. So again, here is the automation approach. So this is the split test, desktop home, and this is the variant. We just pass a cookie at, at the rate, and then it bypasses all the other variant and just gives us this clear variant we are asking for. I'm gonna show you a 20 seconds video how we are doing it using um, browser stack and it will be clear look at the actions that is happening here on the right side you will be able to see see how coolly we are able to do the a b test and the test takes only 41 seconds which is awesome time so it's just going to our 
home page, it's setting the cookies. Um, then it's, it's testing that the type ahead is working. Like type ahead is one of our core feature. Um, so that's all. So if you see here, refresh, it's setting the cookie here. Uh, so now it is on a, a particular variant, then it's, it's just testing that, okay, the type ahead works. Awesome. Uh, now let's talk about the next challenges. How many of us just go to production and test? I guess very few because the production test call uh, synthetic uh, monitoring, right? Like we don't do as a QA team, we don't test on production all the time. Like we have to make sure we test in lower environment, right? And uh, that's a challenge because most of the company has security policies. And if you have internal environments, uh, you have to make sure you are able to reach uh, a cloud partner right browser stack from your internal environment and for longest in my career we have used uh, local testing with other vendors and it sucked the blood blood out of me because it was so slow right so what are some of the modern approaches you can take to make it awesome so what we do is we use our cdn which is content delivery network but let me talk about the local testing that browser stack offers pretty cool it's just like you have to set up a desired capability um saying local testing equal to true you have to whitelist some of their um, ips from their servers and uh, that will create a tunnel between your server and there and uh, you you could run like access it from your local um local servers or internal um, websites, right? But that sometimes bring in latency, it can bring in dependency. So suppose, uh, though it never happens, but if some cases, um, if some of their service center is down or there is any security issue happening, like you will not be able to run using local testing. So how can you make a redundant solid infra, which is not completely dependent on your third party, right? That's how we do it using CDN content delivery network. Um, so to name a few, Fastly and Cloudflare is example. So what they are, they are, is a, they are the proxy servers, which is in between our local um, and uh, browser stack. Uh, whenever we, we create a request from browser stack, it, it understands that request and then it routes to our internal um, infra. Uh, so it, we also use uh, CDN for a lot of various cases, like for high availability, for load balancing, for detecting bot traffic. And I'm gonna explain you a little more um, as we go over like how we actually use it in our automation approach. So again, uh, so if you look at this, uh, this, thing like this left side, just think of it as a browser stack um, web request. So when we request from browser stack, suppose goodrx.com, we set an internal cookie in our header. And then fastly like our CDN reads that cookie and says, okay, this is not a bot. This is not a crawler. This is actually a test that is coming in and I'm gonna read out it to the page. Uh, if it is AB test, if it is anything particularly we want, any environment, it will gonna go and route it and give us the page we want. So again, on the right side, I'm telling you how we are doing it. So you have to have a fake page first, which you will be um, loading with your base URL. You will be setting the cookie because that's how Selenium works. And once you set the cookie and request it, it will hit our um, proxy servers through Fastly and, and then we, it's gonna read out. So what are some of the problems that we, real time problems that we solve using this infra, right? So some main problem we had uh, in the past was geolocation. So goodrx.com only works inside um, US. It does not work outside US. So when browser stack started becoming big, they, they launched their server from Ireland. And suddenly all our tests started going to Ireland and it started failing, all our pipeline failing. So just think of 16,000 tests failing in a day and we were running for our life. How do we solve this? So again, we solved this using CDN where for what we do is we set this cookie, we tell Fastly that, okay, this is coming from browser stack, does not matter where it comes. We set up a rule which, which accepts the GDPR whitelisting outside of US, and then it maps with a, a Santa Monica IP. So it actually fakes the IP so that we can, yeah, like, we can get our test running on US and get the geolocation set up correctly. So super helpful, super handy. The other issue we ran into is course. 
So our website is made of various different systems, right? Content, web, mobile web, and blog. And, and uh, Fastly is doubting it based on um, whatever page we want to hit, right? But again, sometimes in lower environment, um, it's not might be set up correctly. It, there might be uh, environment mismatch. So suppose I am on content page, I'm trying to go to the um, mobile web page or blog page, but it's actually trying to hit uh, production instead of um, test, right? That time course issue happens. And again, we resolve it using a CDN. And then header whitelisting. So we have to make sure that we that like there is no DDoS ha attack happening. There's no broad uh, crawling, right? Because then a number of um, requests will go up. We already have 19, uh, like 13 to 19 million uh, people using our website in a month. So we have to make sure that we are uh, making sure that crawlers are not crawling at the time when our user uses, right? So again, we do that using this Fastly configuration. Uh, some other benefits that this Fastly configuration gives us when we set this internal cookie that helps us um, uh, actually tell our, our data system, our web analytics like GA system that this is a test, don't count it for a real, um, real uh, user, right? Because our tests are running 24 by seven as a synthetic monitoring as well in production like the core tests uh, it also excludes any a b test so we can we, when we set the internal um, cookie we tell them tell our system that disable all the a b tests that running all over our system uh, that happens using that as well uh, again when we need to run a specific a b test i'll show you how we set it. i already showed you how we set that right then we also disable service and captcha like another very big problem uh, when it comes to automation, suddenly you will see some survey pages showed up. Um, suddenly some CAPTCHA showed up for security reasons, right? Uh, our uh, system also has those. And again, using the same internal cookie, we are telling those like through pen, um, through Fastly, we are telling that uh, please, when it is, it's a test request, do not serve those CAPTCHA or surveys to us. Again, um, allow access from outside. It's one of the main key point that I told you that um, because browser stack has various service center, this is how we make sure that our systems are getting getting a US IP. So next is line in mobile app automation. It's another beast. And how do you make sure when you're running millions of tests, uh, your infra is, is super solid, though you are dependent on a third party like uh, browser stack, right? Um, so these are some of the cool core features that we do. Um, the first one is um, custom ID when we are setting the app binary upload. So we have again CI in, in our mobile application as well. Every time our developer changing something, it cre creates a binary in, and using Bitrise, uh, we upload it in a browser stack. So there are hundreds of builds that we are uploading in browser stack every day. And every time a developer uploads, they are running the, the test um, that they need to. But from a QA standpoint, we want to run our regression on a particular build, right? How do we do that? So uh, like in 100, how do we find the one build that we need? So that we solve using a feature that browser stack offers called custom ID. So we pass our build number inside that custom ID. And when we, so that way we know exactly which build number we are uh, targeting and where the actual regression need to happen before we publish that app. And again, I'm gonna show you a small video here using browser stack, um, which will show you both like the custom ID as well as the debug capability. Give me one second. Let me actually talk about the debug capability a little bit. So the debug capability is a hidden feature which you are seeing on the left side. Um, it only shows up for our tests and it, it lets us set various parameter, uh, which makes our test super fast, right? It also helps us with A-B testing. So again, we have A-B testing in our native mobile apps and using this, we can go to this uh, debug um, feature. We can set any A-B test we want and then we can run. And here is again another 20 seconds video to show how we are doing it in browser stack. So if you see the custom ID here, we are setting it to 5356, which is actually our build number. So when uh, we run our regression through our Jenkins, we will just pass this as a build number and it will fetch this particular build. Now it's showing that it's going to the um, 
debug window setting a particular a b test now it's starting to run the tests so this is this is how it becomes super solid and very easy for us uh, to make sure what we're testing and again within two minutes of time which is very hard to crank uh, in a mobile uh, mobile application because there is some initial setup which takes time to fire up the um, fire up the app okay so let's talk about de uh, device fuzzing so what is device fuzzing so we have again our customers or various devices right we have to test that top four or five devices are working correctly when it comes to app and browser stack gives us like all the latest uh, devices to use uh, from right so how we do it is on when we set the uh, capabilities we randomly choose a device a real-time device and we make sure that if we have 20 test cases we are fuzzing it with at least four to five devices so that brought up a challenge for us if one of the test fails how we will make sure next time we are not running on a different devices because we are fuzzing so our framework takes that also into consideration and it makes sure that it retests on the same device that we have first uh, spin up so that gives us the coverage we need real time device device coverage and also it it helps us to uh, cooperate with our browser stack where they have rule that if you are on a latest devices, you can only spin maybe 80 at a time, right? Suppose you are uh, testing iOS 14, right? On, on iPhone X, which is the latest device. Though we have 160 parallel, we won't be able to uh, spin up all iOS because then their other customers will be affected. So in that time, we might be spinning up only 40 I, uh, iPhone X, 40 iPhone XR uh, like that so that it's, it's good for both of us. And the last one is accessibility ID parity. So in a lot of company I see like they have separate framework, they have separate test for uh, iOS and Android, though both have similar kind of um, paths and similar kind of features, right? So what we do in GoodRx is that um, we make sure that we have only one framework. So we have monolith and each test can run on any platform, be it web, be it mobile web, even on apps, right? So that gives us a lot of flexibility on maintenance and time. But how we achieve is in a couple of ways. One is accessibility ID parity. So suppose one button on iOS, if it is called um, search dot something right we will make sure in android also it calls same and if it does not uh, does not have the same accessibility id we actually use object wrapper to wrap it around but again it's the same test that we use we also are looking into again tagging and uh, uh, deep linking so we want to pass our uh, tags like what what test we want to run in and which page we want to start from and then uh, the build will understand it from our uh, parameters and it's going to give us that exact screen in the activity or the screen we want to start on so that's something we are working on right now so what are the what are the benefits we get using all those tactics first is less less fragile test uh, next is less maintenance so if you have just one test and you are running making it uh, run on all platform you know um, the maintenance becomes uh, drastically less right you are looking at one test one repo and you don't have to go run around and, and find the test in in various places right um, then it, it gives us record speed as well and it gives us broad coverage so these are some of the uh, cool benefits we get using that the last section i'm going to talk about ai tools that uh, uh, goodrx is using so first one is automated visual regression and some of you guys have already gone through the part parsi presentation that uh, breakpoint had and i heard really good feedback on that uh, this year we're going to look into it so what's automated visual regression is um, you first take a snapshot of your website that becomes baseline then you every time you are you are pushing something your system captures an image and then it compares, right? So if you do a bit by bit comparison, it will look something like that on the left side. Uh, but our website is very, very dynamic, right? So when it, it's super dynamic, you have to make sure that you have different capabilities where you are uh, making sure that there is a way to ignore region. There is different level of matching. Um, like sometimes we want to match the content. Sometimes we want to 
only match the HTML uh, inside that uh, page, um, but it makes it super easy for like a content heavy website, goodrx.com to check within minutes that everything is in place and let us find a lot of awesome, um, like a lot of awesome bugs. The next AI tool we use is uh, dashboards for reporting. One is reportportal.io and we also have a data-driven dashboard using um, Datadog. And I'm gonna show it to you in, in the next slide what those are. And some of the things that we haven't used yet but we want to use is called AI-driven test selection. So just uh, think of a system like AppSurify where you could just uh, attach the SDK to your Git and it will understand that which files are getting changed and select test uh, depending on that. I think being a QA engineer, I a lot of times see my team struggle and they want to run every possible automation on this earth um, and make sure that everything is pass passing. Like that's how we operate. We want to get that um, assurance that, okay, we are not missing anything, but utilizing this kind of AI driven test selection can drastically improve your test time where you are not over testing stuff that you are not uh, need to right so it, it 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 actually learns over the time depending on who are who is the developer what files are changed what time of the day you are pushing that change and depending on that it actually selects the test which is pretty cool and we will be running POCs pretty soon on that so coming to the reportportal.io, this is this is the left side is the screen. This is like a one-stop shop for uh, GoodRx developers and QAs to go and see that what are the builds running, how long it took, um, if it fails, the, uh, the st uh, stack trace is seen here as well. So super easy. Uh, I recommend it, it to everyone. Like if you want, if you are looking into dashboarding, look at uh, report portal. Uh, it also, again, it has machine learning. So over the time it learns um, what if it is an environment issue or if it is a real bug and it tells you. So again, awesome. We are using it for last few months and seeing great results. And at the right side, you're seeing our data, uh, data doc dashboard. So it's very, very important for us um, to know that what tests are slow. So it's like some of here, you could see that if we are checking how long it's taking and what are the tests that is super slow, which browser is the most slow browser? Everybody knows, no guess, no price for guessing, it's IE. Um, again, what time of the day we are running most of the tests, how long our bills are taking. So when you have this kind of infra to monitor your own tests, uh, it gives you excellent benefit to know your weak points and where exactly you need to work next to make it super solid. Uh, again, some of the benefits from those tool is component level testing, whole screen testing from visual validation, less reputation because the system learns by its same speed, like using visual regression we have achieved, like it used to take us six hours to do regression, right, right now we do less than six minutes. Um, and again, it has improved quality tremendously. So some other cool techniques and I'm almost at 43 minutes, so I'm gonna uh, wrap it pretty fast. Our team uses tagging very well. Like when we talk about tagging, uh, only thing that comes to mind is priority, right? You want to know your test P0 or P1, but you could utilize farther and you can have project tags and utility tags. And I'm gonna talk about utility tags that Kudarix use, uses. Uh, one thing that we do is if we have full kind of third party feature like visual test or a SMS test or something. So you can enable and disable those feature uh, using a tag. So we have a particular tag to say, hey, run visual test on this functional tests or run, uh, do not run visual test, but don't fail it. Uh, same, we enable AB test using uh, tagging. We could uh, even enable parallel um, testing using tagging. So if we say at the rate serial, it will, run the test serially and not uh, uh, using parallel threads. Why, why do we need that? Sometimes when you are doing like registrations or payment systems, you don't want to use the parallel thread. Sometimes it creates issues. So very specific kind of test, we run it um, serially. Then again, you can use uh, skip uh, tags to skip any test in a specific environment. So we enable and disable environments using our utility tags. 
another uh, very significant way to make your test super fast is called lazy loading. Again, one of our uh, core um, staff estate has came up with this. Uh, none of these are my inventions. So this is the whole team effort. So how we do it, we define the element of the play uh, on the page class without initializing them, but we access them as we need it. So that way we are not initializing uh, throughout the test and that makes our test super solid and very fast. And already spoke about third party wrappers. So uh, again, like if you're using with third party, please use object wrappers so that like if they suddenly uh, upgrade their SDK, you don't have to upgrade it and the failures will be graceful. These are some of the references and uh, that that's the uh, end. I write blogs on my website, Pretech Mom. You can connect with me on in Twitter, pretty active. So last one year after I started speaking, I have 400 uh, followers there, super proud of all organic. So uh, do hit me up uh, in, through any of these chan channels. If you have any further questions or if you want to see any code snippet, uh, how we are actually implementing them. I'm more than happy to um, connect with you and show you. Thanks, Priyanka. Uh, I think that was that was a great uh, great talk. Uh, you know, thanks for opening up your playbook and you know going into detail uh, with all the different parts. Um, to your point about questions, there are a lot of questions, uh, so we should uh, get to those. Um, I think. You showed a bunch of metrics. Um, we have some good questions around um, ar around the metrics. Um, first off, uh, where are you sort of getting um, this data on? You know, number of tests that you've ran um, and the ones that have passed and failed. Where is that data coming from? That's coming from browser stack analytics page. So browser stack has an analytic page which shows you. Uh, how your system is performing. Uh, we are not doing anything thanks to BrowserStack. They have created that capability. So all those screenshots are from BrowserStack admin portal. Uh, or like I have reached out to our um, our account manager, Ritwik, and, and got the last two ones. But like this is something that BrowserStack uh, takes care of. And it's super helpful. Like when we go and see that we have only 0.18% failure, that's mm -hmm. amazing. That. And we make sure as a team, we are like continuously monitoring and seeing. So that is like the external dashboard and the internal mm -hmm. one I showed the data dog. So we are actually, every time we run, we are sending this data to our data dog um, systems, right? So, and there we have specific uh, ones that we want to understand. Like we want to know mm -hmm. which test is flaky, right? Which fails like, which doesn't have a pattern, just fails yeah. sometimes and why is it failing? We want to know which browser is the slowest so that like we can go one step further and refine like, maybe we will not run a uh, heavy test on that browser just the core functionalities so that we are doing using our uh, data log dashboard where internally we are monitoring each test um, through that got it um question around i think you'd mentioned um sort of uh, reaching like a 90 90 percent uh, pass rate benchmark um right. how do you sort of come up with that number so this was actually ran by one of the competitor of browser stack last year uh, using some of the biggest companies like Visa, MasterCard, um, some more. And I can again share the link on my website or the, through my Twitter um, link. They actually came up with uh, the benchmarking, the industry benchmarking. So as a QA leader, I always uh, go through all these reports and make myself uh, very aware that where the industry is. I encourage everyone to do that. Um, and through using those reports and they are various, I just chose one of them because I follow mm -hmm. them. Right. Um, so they actually published this four categories where they said, like, if you are into automation, this is what it should be looking like. Right. And that's, mm -hmm. that's what is our, our go-to goal. Got it. Yeah, that would be great. I think if you can send that out, um, question around, um, why don't you use simulators? Um, what's the benefit of using uh, real devices over emulators or simulators? Like, as I told you, like some of the bugs, like throughout my career, I have seen like simulators usually does not um, detect them. So that's why we don't 
try not to use simulators. There are cases mm -hmm. where we do use simulators. One example will be analytics automation. So there, if we are not able to uh, get the proxy to tell us the HTTP um, events, right? HTTP status back with the events we are looking mm -hmm. for, we use simulators there, but very specific. When it comes to functional testing, we use real devices. And, and that's why like browser stack is our very good partner in that because in mobile web also we run in real devices, like firing up real devices and not um, simulators. And it's astonishing how much bugs we can find um, running it on a real device, exact device that our users are using, right? Again, we look mm -hmm. into our GA Google Analytics, figure out where our top uh, users are, and then we run it on that. And the benefit is that all like the bugs they are supposed to get, we already find it beforehand. Um, another question, um, this is sort of going into the flagging. How do you manage uh, uh, how do you manage um, features behind uh, the combinatorics behind uh, the switches, um, the ones that are not accepted for final release, um, even if it's just five feature switches, um, you know, regarding each feature as non-interfering and non-interacting? So there are two ways. I, I showed it in my, in my mm -hmm. um, presentation, right? One is when we set the internal cookie, right? that actually tells our system that disable every possible A-B test. It actually takes us, to, takes us to the control page, which is like the main, right? Without any variant, mm -hmm. it takes us, so you will not see any, any uh, A-B test. But when we are testing a particular A-B test, we test it using the tag that I showed you. So we're gonna set that particular A-B test uh, using the A-B flags, uh, A-B tags. And uh, that way we actually reach the page that, that we are targeting to test. So suppose there are five different tests running, we're gonna have mm -hmm. like five different AB folders and five different uh, tags. And each, like for each variant, we're gonna run through our core test to make sure that nothing is broken, right? At the end of the day, like searching drugs, going to price page and uh, emailing coupon is our bread and butter. So yeah. if, our, if, if our product is running, suppose, uh, five different A-B tests on main page, which is home page, right? We have to have all the core tests run on those different, different variants. And we set that variant using tags. And again, that tags uh, becomes a cookie behind the scene mm -hmm. and tells fastly that, okay, uh, please make us land on this A-B test variant. Got it. Thanks for answering that. Um, could you please like uh, share sort of the practice that you follow, um, you know, in logging from the time that you log a bug uh, to make making sure that it's actually fixed. Practices will be like, there are different, if it is a production bug, again, we have a, a whole system, right? Where if it is a production bugs, we open up a Slack channel, it, depending on the uh, priority of the bugs, it gets guest, uh, get work out like really quick. Yeah. Uh, then it comes to the QA and it goes to production, right, as a patch. Mm -hmm. But if it is a lower environment bugs, again, we have a whole Kanban process happening, Jira ticketing happening. I have like dedicated QA for each verticals. Uh, they are very embedded in a team. So they come up with the priorities if it is, if it is going in the same sprint or a very different sprint and then um, they go uh, fix it and make sure that it's making it to production. So again, like inside whole GoodRx QA and developers are one team, right? Uh, depending mm -hmm. on the vertical and squad, uh, they decide by themselves where exactly that bug is and how they will be fixing and making sure it's not making it to production. Uh, we do a pretty good job at that. If the question was through our automation, like every time uh, autumn pipeline fails, the developer goes and checks if it is a real failure or a flaky. If it is a real failure, they create a Jira ticket, uh, fix it, and then only they can push it to production. So they take our automation pipeline very, very seriously. Like if it if it doesn't pass, it, it will not go to production. Awesome. Thanks for that. Um, we have a question asking for your input on um, for a QA specialist, uh, how do you recommend them spending uh, their time between you know doing exploration tests and you know moderate monitoring um, test automation between the two so how uh, like i preferred it as as like i have completely again separate test same as the previous um, speaker told right like i have a qe engineering team and a state uh, in each 
a vertical each team so i don't think it is possible like if you want to be automation specialist to do manual testing at the same time be perfect mm. on automation right if your goal is to become automation specialist and sdet you eventually have to run the test first manually and like run it understand it and then only you can automate it right so the like exploratory testing will become uh, like will happen in the beginning right when you are learning about what test you want to automate and then you you dig dig down and deep and uh, you start automating it but i would suggest that understand what is your interest in like what interest you are you a qa rockstar and you want to be a exploratory tester um and and not a automation engineer though like automation is is like required in today's world but not you don't want to be a specialist right uh, then like i learn a lot of this newer tool like how to do ab test like even when i do interview for quality engineers a lot of people doesn't even know what's a ab test what feature flag right um so learn all this newer technologies that is happening throughout uh, the qa world right learn to use tools like browser stack um per parsi and all those like uh, report portal.io learn to debug uh, debug test right so this gives you an edge over any other normal qa engineer and then like divert like if you want to be an sdet and if you want to be an automation mm-hmm. specialist then then the path will be completely different we have a question um to almost I'm going to take a few more questions um do you have any resources um that we can look at to help set up data dog reporting um i can point out to some resources i'll share it uh, again on my twitter handle look out for that awesome. absolutely guys will be dropping uh priyanka's twitter handle in the chat um exactly pri underscore tech underscore mom it was there in throughout my slides people who have concentrated on my slides know my team i'm just kidding <laughs> um so last question um how long did gorax how long did the team at gorax take uh, to establish the framework um and have you know test ca- cases like execute consistently it took us only two engineers and uh, three months to Uh, make the core path on goodrx.com again i have been super lucky to know some of the brightest estates not going to tell their names so that you don't hire them from me no <laughs> i'm kidding it's vahan melikan and sale um they were my core um estates in my team uh, who came and built it from scratch along with me uh, made my vision uh, possible so in 2018 october there was only one uh qa engineers i joined as a manager and i built the team from scratch uh, but it took only two estates along with me mm-hmm. um to build the basic but right now today i have a strong team of 28 people who supports more than like 15 teams and that's why like you could see we are running like 16000 tests a day so the core frameworks were done in 3 months awesome i think we've covered a lot of the questions any remaining questions i think we will okay yeah we have one um could you please talk a bit about how your team is handling visual validation across browser sure. devices sure so again visual validation is a added parks top of functional automation that we do right so how we do is it depends on the functionality on the uh, pages that we want to do any content related um checks we do it through visual validation so when we are test casing or t- our test strategizing we make sure what are the tests that will be functional and what mm-hmm. are the tests on top of that functional test will be visual that get decided and then when you are writing the test you make sure that you are enabling um the visual test with the tag right that i showed you it's it's like super robust in our system so you don't have to do anything um as such other than adding the tag that you want to enable visual um test and then just adding one line which is like open eyes take the screenshots uh and and compare it again what kind of comparison you want to do you just pass that parameter in that test right um so that happens when you write it and then you just uh, run it and make sure it, it's stable and it's sta- it's looking at the proper element or proper page uh, proper uh, check level and that's how we make it and then once it runs it it captures the baseline so you go to the like we use apply tool so we go to the apply tool dashboard make sure the uh, baseline is captured and again 
if any time it fails, our developers go to the dashboard, either gives a thumbs up or thumbs down if it is a real bug or uh, intended change. That's how it happens. Awesome. Um, I think that's it, the time we have for questions. Uh, Priyanka, thanks for coming on board. Um, I think it was awesome having you once again. Um, I think everyone really loved your talk. Uh, Thank you. For any questions, guys, that I have not covered, um, we will do our best to you know, follow up maybe um, in a, in a follow-up blog. Um, but you can always you know, tweet directly uh, to Priyanka. Yes, please. Any encouraging word will be super helpful. And again, I want to thank my team, um, specifically in the estate ones. Like They have done tremendous job. Whatever I share today, it's all their hard work. Uh, I might just come with a vision, but they are the people who make it happen. So uh, thank you again to my team. Awesome. Thanks, Priyanka. Thank you.